My name is Karina Harney, Playboy's Playmate of the Year, 1992. And I'm Echo Johnson, Miss January, 1993. Welcome to the Bunny Chronicles. Let's go. Hi, welcome back to the show. What's up, Carrie? Hi, Echo. We got Miss Carrie Yazel back in the studio. Oh, I see the bunny. I pulled it out. I Special love occasion. I, I had to love. dig around, though. <laughs> I couldn't find mine, so I have this little gold one, but it'll suffice. <laughs> I had to clean it. <laughs> and Carrie, Carrie and I are rocking the pink without even knowing. I love it. So okay. So we have a super amazing guest today. I'm so excited. This is an absolute honor. Um, Victoria Valentino. Playboy's Miss September 1963, one of the top 100 centerfolds of the 20th century. Uh, But Victoria actually started her career as a bunny at the Playboy Clubs at the L.A. Club when it opened in 1964 on New Year's Eve. Now, Victoria has a long list of accomplishments and accolades, and I just cannot wait to get into everything. Um, She's a media personality, keynote speaker, author, activist, uh, performs live theater, spoken word, and she mentors sexual assault survivors as she's one of Cosby's rape survivors. And that's going to be a really, um, we'll get into that towards the end, but very important what she accomplished. So welcome to the show, Miss Victoria. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. You got it. So we're going to start start out with the bunny ears because uh, Carrie and I, and as I told you last night when I was speaking to you, we have the, the bunny manual and we were just going through it and it's so detailed and it's so interesting and it was very progressive for its time in terms of, you know, what you guys got paid, the benefits that were offered, whatnot. Um, specifically, what stood out to me was... First, you guys had um, health insurance and you had tax advice. And that's like unheard of at that time. So tell us about that. I had no idea. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's my entire statement. I had no idea we were getting paid. I think it was two dollars and three cents an hour. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Three inch heels and those costumes. We had to show up um, before work in the dressing room an hour ahead of time. Right. And check out our costumes from the uh, wardrobe mistress. Right. And, and she was everything. important, right? The wardrobe mistress and the bunny mom were important figures because the detail or the attention to detail rather was uber important right down to your costume. So tell, tell us about that. Oh, absolutely. Everything had to be perfect. You couldn't go onto the floor with a scuffed shoe. Your three-inch heels had to match your costume. You were assigned two costumes with two different colors. They had to be checked out and turned back in at the end of your shift. Mm -hmm. Eight-hour shifts, let me tell you, that was (laughs) not so easy. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're, you had to wear your ears in a certain way. You had to have a clean tail, obviously. Yeah. And you couldn't have a run in your stockings. And, of course, um, in the early 60s, that was when pantyhose were actually first invented. Oh, really? You know, they, there had been tights before for dancers, but they were professional garments. But actual uh pantyhose that was a new thing in the beginning of the of the 60s hmm. up until then we had to wear you know regular stockings with seams and garter belts and and may i mention cotex belts <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> cotex belts <laughs> oh yeah more uncomfortable <laughs> it was so fun let me just oh, wow. tell you <laughs> we thought we had it hard <laughs> thinking about it <laughs> you guys have it easy that's wild so, yeah, uh, and so our- the way we designed the costumes they designed the costumes so the bust uh, the bodice was lower than anybody's normal boobs were okay And so that made you have to stuff them. So you put in rubber bust pads and then you dropped your own boobs on top of them. So it made you look twice as large as you normally were. And most of us, Uh most of us were fairly busty. I remember the shock I had one day showing up in the dressing room and there was this one bunny who I thought had, you know, a great, great bust line. 
And she was flat as a pancake. And she was standing there with surgical tape, <gasps> pulling herself together to make cleavage. Wow. Then two rubber bust pads in the bodice. And that made her look like she was very well endowed. I, I was just mesmerized, you know. <laughs> I was yeah. like, no. That, but, that's great that she got hired crazy. knowing that that I mean that I love to hear that that because everybody likes different shapes and sizes so I yeah. think that's nice well yeah I mean and the bunnies did you know display I mean it was a broad spectrum of ethnicities okay. and looks and everything it was important uh -huh. yeah yeah well you know um the, the bunnies were were really kind of trendsetters I mean we had the chocolate bunnies, which, mm -hmm. and we had the first Chinese playmate mm -hmm. and the second Chinese playmate, both of whom were bunnies. I worked the playmate bar much to my chagrin. I wanted to work the showrooms, but, you know, um, because my centerfold was backlit hanging over the cash register. Oh, uh, cool. I wound up working the playmate bar and uh, I was working with Gwen Wong, who was the second. Uh, Chinese playmate, but she became a playmate after she was a bunny. China Lee was already a playmate and then became a bunny. But it was and very uncommon, right, to have both, you know, be a bunny no. and a playmate? No, you can be either or. You know, some of the playmates never wanted to become a bunny, but if you wanted to become a money, bunny, you were a shoe in because you were already a playmate and they wanted, you know, as many of the gorgeous gals sure. in the centerfold to be bunnies as they possibly could. Okay. But you could be a bunny and, and still not qualify to be a centerfold. Are yeah. you friends uh, with anyone? Do you have any acquaintances from back in that those times? Oh, absolutely. I have a circle of old bunny friends. Mm. Um, China Lee, by the way, who and I'm not terribly close with, but one of my best friends for the last, well, who was my training bunny oh. in 64. Oh. She and I are still friends. She's my kid's auntie. I'm her kid's auntie. Her kids and are in their 60s. And she lives in Selma, Alabama, half the year. And the other half of the year, she lives in Sydney, Australia. And uh, she was one of the original Chocolate Bunnies, has a book called The Chocolate Bunny. Oh, that's Francesca. And, uh, Francesca. Yeah, she's going to come on the show. Yeah, I can't wait to interview I her. I love hearing that. Mm -hmm. That makes me so happy that you've kept in yeah. touch because... That's yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's, well, she uh, Fran was always the hub of the bunny wheel. I think probably had it not been for Fran, I probably wouldn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. But she and I stayed in touch, mm -hmm. and so because of her, you know, everybody else that she knew became part of our inner circle. What was your favorite part of of being a bunny? Hmm. Well, truthfully, I was never really thrilled about being a bunny. It was very hard work. Mm -hmm. I had been, um, I just escaped from uh, a, a trafficking situation after I had become a playmate, uh, courtesy of my son's father. Um, he began trafficking me oh, wow. um, because suddenly I had a little celebrity status that he could then use. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so um, he trafficked me to big celebrity names. I had been a New York trained and Connecticut trained actress, nine years of classical ballet. Um, you know, I did Shakespeare. I did legit theater. And uh, believe me, <sighs> being a pinup was not part of my agenda. It was his idea. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, this was 1963. Mm -hmm. And um, I had grown up in Connecticut, very conservative, pre-revolutionary war town. And uh, so, uh, but I was born in Hollywood. So after I graduated high school, I wound up in, uh, back in West Hollywood, again, courtesy of my folks. So I was sort of a pawn on everybody else's chessboard, it seemed, at that time in my life. And... Um, so 
he wound up marketing me to, you know, big stars. I mean, people who, um, you know, are honored and iconic mm -hmm. people. Uh, wow. And that's, that's, that's horrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's insane, Victoria. Yeah, it, it really was horrible. So I managed to escape from it, uh, October 64. Okay. Thanks to my parents. And, you know, there's a whole story behind that, which I don't want to go into. Yeah, you can that's read, fine. That's fine, read yeah. my damn book, you yeah. know, <laughs> read your book. <laughs> right. And, uh, but the thing, the thing is that, um, I, my first job after I got out of there was, uh, cocktailing at the whiskey a go, go and oh, Johnny cool. River was playing live there. You know, I met my thrill on blueberry Hill and the go, go dancers. And, you know, I mean, it was fun. It was lighthearted. There were six hour shifts. You got to dress in uh, little black short skirts with fishnet hose and, you know, look like a, a French, a patch dancer, you know, mm -hmm. and you just weave around with your tray on your fingertips. And, and it was a lot of fun and we made a lot of money and it was very loose and easy. And you didn't have any particular regulations like you did at Playboy. Mm -hmm. Well, I worked there a month and one of the other waitresses said, Hey, did you know there there's a Playboy Club opening on the strip? And you know, you're a playmate. We should go down. I'm sure you'll get a job. And so I thought, well, yeah, that sounded like a smart move. And uh, so I did. Of course, I went down like we both were hired. And um it was it it turned into really a difficult, difficult um difficult job mm -hmm. i mean you know you were taught you had two weeks training before you could go on the floor mm -hmm. for the opening the opening was new year's eve and so it was like a really big deal everybody was there all the big stars and half flew in from chicago and all of his buddies and so um we had um I mean, wasn't it like you had 150 different drinks that you had to remember the mix, everything to call out to the bartender and then the placement on your tray? Everything had to be the particular the way yeah. you carried it, the way the, you the delivered it. Well, <laughs> yeah, this is true. I don't know the number of drinks, but I know even even working at the whiskey, you know, you have uh, every bartender expects his cocktail waitress to have a calling order, you know, mm -hmm. So however he delivers it is not necessarily the way you wind up setting it down at the table. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you have to do a lot of math in your head, you know, and, and remember all of the stuff if you have several tables. So it was really, it was quite a challenge, but yeah. And we had to, the thing was we had to uh, mix the drinks at the table backwards because oh. if we if we if we served forwards, our boobs would fall out. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> so, Wild. <yeah. laughs> Makes sense. So, so you know the, the two the two moves that were were taught to us were um, uh, the bunny dip, which was moving, uh, you know, carrying the tray and then holding the tray all the time while you were mixing at the table. And pouring drinks backwards. Wow. So you That's had a physical to job. Be standing. Yeah. yeah. And and say if you had a table of four right there, that's probably a minimum of a 25 pound tray. Mm. So imagine if you had a table of six or eight, which you know, yeah, you had yeah. a time. For sure. You know, so for instance, you just ordered a scotch and water. Sounds pretty simple, right? Yeah, you had a shot glass of scotch. You had a a rock glass, and then you had a glass carafe of water. So that was just one drink. Mm. Wow, the details. So he, yeah, so you had that. Maybe some guy wanted a beer. You had to be taught how to pour a beer backwards and not overflow it, not have too much foam. Oh. You know, not have a, a beer without any any head on it sure. so you know it, everything was taught to us and everything was absolute perfection and aside from that you had um always to worry about your costume you couldn't have a stain you couldn't have a run you couldn't wear your your uh ears incorrectly 
everything had to be perfect. And we had false eyelashes and wigs and false fingernails. Mm-hmm. Nobody had acrylic nails in those days. They were stick-ons. Right. They were glued on. Did it make so, um, being a playmate even sound more appealing? I mean, did you did so you? So she have was a playmate the, first. Did, actually, I'm realizing. Oh, that's right. 1963. 1963. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, did yeah. as a playmate, did you do things like we had promotions where we'd go and sign sign autographs? And did you have any of that kind of thing? No. Um, the deal was well. First of all, uh, at that time. There was only one photo studio, only one Playboy outpost on the West Coast at all. Mm -hmm. And that was Mario Casilli's photo studio on North Highland in Hollywood. And um, we went and we did all the candids, you know, on location. And we did um, the centerfold in the studio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he had the 8x10 still camera. And they wanted... uh, my hair was kind of a, you know, kind of a dirty blonde, goldy color. And um, he shot a lot of the candidates and a lot of the test shots for the centerfold on location. And um, when they got the film back with this one pose that Hef wanted, um, it was had a green tint on it. You know, this was before photo correction, mm-hmm. before Photoshop, all of that. This was real film shot with real cameras Mm -hmm. and uh so they couldn't correct it so and everything in those days had to be sent back to chicago for hef to approve right and of course this is also before email Mm -hmm. so everything was done by snail mail and (laughs) wow yeah so anyway so hef decided that he wanted to recreate this one shot It was really beautiful. It was in this um, pale yellow peignoir standing in this Italian marble palazzo. And I was leaning against this beautiful brown marble column with the late afternoon light shining in. And it was very soft, very feminine. Mm -hmm. And he wanted everything uh, recreated in the studio, me wearing black lace against a white column. And uh, he wanted my hair black. Oh, see, I noticed that in your centerfold, I was shocked that your hair was dark because I've always known you as blonde. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I am blonde. Yeah, because you (laughs) are. You know, I've never heard that before. That's really interesting. I mean, he could have chosen a brunette, but he wanted you and that was the adjustment he needed. Now, was it only topless or... Yeah, yeah, in the 60s, no, it was... Nobody showed any pubic hair in those days at all. So, Everything was either uh, airbrushed out or they posed you in a way where uh, the fabric covered your... your. Yeah. What about your boobs? Was, was that showing it in the 60s? What? Your breasts, were the breasts showing in the 60s or was it still oh, yeah. a silhouette? We showed, you know, he was a boob man. At least he used to be. Yeah. Once upon a time. Yeah, well, it's it's just interesting when you go through the decades, like in the Playboy books, yeah. and you see the progression of the nudity. So that's what we were interested about in the 60s of like, so, what was the span of the nudity at that time? Sure. But in the 50s, um, we were coming out of, um, this was post-World War II, you know, where there were a lot of glamour girls, you know, and, and 50s, Betty Grable. So it was it, truly the girl next door. Mm-hmm. And of course, yeah. that whole girl next door image was uh, fashioned after uh, Janet. Uh, oh, gosh, what was her last name now? Lee? Uh, she Lee? had been the manager of his subscription uh, department. Yeah. And they had a long term affair. Mm hmm. And uh, eventually she moved, um, became a registered nurse and lived in Connecticut. And it was the weirdest thing. My mother and I used to have this little community of singers at the Scottish pub in the Las Feliz area. And we knew without knowing that we knew her first husband. He Janet part Pilgrim. Of our group. Janet Pilgrim. That's- Janet Pilgrim. Yeah. That's- yeah. Of course, her real name was Charlene Whitelaw. <laughs> she is died. Mm. Yeah. And uh and and Hef gave her that name. Mm-hmm. And she's mm-hmm. the only playmate had been who had been a playmate for uh, twice. No, three times. That's right. In the 50s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so amazing. Yeah, so 
you know, it was it was really an innocent time in history. Sure. In the fifties, sure. when she was a playmate, and when Playboy started, so it was really groundbreaking. And then we were breaking out of this kind of repressive uh, sexual period of history, you know, where women couldn't even have their own credit card. You couldn't buy property without your husband or your father's signature. You were really property in so many ways. Mm. You know, you were expected to grow up, get married. If you went to college, you were expected to go to college to find a qualified husband. Right. Yeah. Sounds yeah. familiar. That, that was the time, were, the era, for yeah. sure. Would you so, have uh, done the centerfold if it had been full nudity like it was for us? Mm. Or would that have been just so beyond the times? And would you have gotten a lot more pushback, like from family and friends? Well, first of all, I, I, it was never my choice to become a playmate. It was my husband's idea, mm -hmm. my son's father's idea. We were friends with a professional photographer, an African-American guy, my mother's age, who uh, a guy named Harry Drinkwater, who's since passed away. And he did all of the uh, iconic uh, shots and never got credit for it. Mm. Sadly, because we did a whole bunch of test shoots um, for photos that he submitted to Playboy, thinking in those days that he would be the photographer, mm. not knowing. And so he wound up signing away his rights. Right. And I remember uh, before Mario died, who was my photographer, he said to me, you know, I keep getting credit for that photo with you in the chess set. And he said, no, I just simply don't remember taking it. And I said, <laughs> Cause you because you didn't. <laughs> yeah. That's and, funny. And, and poor Harry, uh, you know, he was very bitter about that because that was really, I mean, it was brilliant work that he did and he never got credit for it. Mm. Was and it ever published anymore? Credit. Anywhere? Were those shots published yet? Oh yeah. Playboy recently them and you they still get you know my 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 calendar shot was a harry drink water shot everything was attributed to mario casilli mm, interesting yeah oh, interesting yeah. And, and, and my son's father scammed uh it got he took the money that i made from the centerfold i never saw a dime and um the the finder's fee which should have gone to harry uh he also took that and then additionally um my family, who they were still back in Connecticut, and they got disinvited to dinner when the host's brother saw my centerfold. It had hit the stands that day, oh. Oh, and he man. told their host, and they were so shocked that they disinvited my parents, and they were just horrified and, and humiliated, and I was disowned for several years because of it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, really threw me into a terrible situation, which made me, of course, very vulnerable to being trafficked because by that time I had our child and I had two stepchildren who were toddlers and he held my children hostage while he sent me off to clients and I was never allowed out of the house with the children alone. Oh, when did, how did you get away from that? And when, what year did you, was it when you started at the Benny Clouds? Were you like, I'm done? You left? No, it was before that. It was October. Um, I had gotten so sick. I couldn't, I just, I was down to nothing. He had starved me and beaten oh, me. He was God. very violent. That's horrible. And so I tried to escape and I, you know, my problem was always, I couldn't leave this, my toddler stepchildren, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Uh, because we were, you know, they didn't know that I wasn't their real mother. That was because he brought them to me when they were so little, mm. and I, and uh, it was heartbreaking. And my son was fourteen months old, and uh, finally um, he went out to take the babysitter home one night, and I found that I had no choice. And my parents had already moved out from Connecticut. My father had gone back to Disney's working. He was a background artist. And um, I, I felt I, we were living in Laurel Canyon and they were living down on Hollywood Boulevard near the opening of the canyon. And suddenly I felt safe harbor is within reach, you know? Mm. 
And I just had to make a real decision. And I knew he'd be back shortly. And he always had a girlfriend who was willing to jump in and take care of the children. So I had to just pack up the baby and and uh, and go do what you had to do. Get out. Uh, yeah, yeah, just to save my life because I was I had gone down to like seventy two pounds. Oh, oh my goodness! I I was dry retching. He was karate oh. chopping me across the throat, backhanding me, knocking me down. Well, anyway, he caught me and beat me for three no. hours oh. until I was unconscious. Oh, good God. And then um, when I was able when I came to like the next day or something, I managed to sneak a call to my mother and she was going to come up with my father who was, you know, older and I was afraid for him. So I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll figure it out, you know, and, um, trying to protect them. Yeah. Trying to protect them while they were trying to protect Mm -hmm. me and, Anyway, uh, she consulted with one of my aunties who said, call the damn cops. Don't wait another minute. And so she did. And they came up to the house and saw racially mixed people in the house, my children and him. And uh, they busted us all. There was one guy who was a friend of a friend of my husband's who had a single joint of marijuana in his pocket. Somebody who just randomly come over, and it was a felony in those days. Right. Busted everybody. They took my children away from me, and my kids were in a foster home. My baby was in a foster home for a whole year before I was allowed to take him back. Good God. so So working at the Playboy Club was showing that I could be a responsible mother. Okay. He And he was in jail. And the FBI were visiting me because he must have been involved with something, which I, to this day, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a horrible situation. So, you know, all the other girls, and the bunnies were having a good time. It was like a sorority and, and many of them, it was the only glamorous thing that ever had happened to them in their lives. And, and to this day. Mm-hmm. You know, of course. Yeah, no, it, it was it was profound for, you Victoria, know, were you later in life a- able to meet a nice man that you could trust after all that you've been through? Was there any positive men that you went, OK, they're not all. Yeah, it's it's hard after that because you don't trust. Yeah. I mean, well, no, I've really never uh, had. um I've never had a positive relationship. Um, my second daughter's father, I thought, was uh, you know the love of my life. And then when I got pregnant with her, he wanted me to have an abortion. And it was my third pregnancy for him. I'd lost the previous two. And um, I was determined to have her. And he abandoned me twice during that pregnancy. Mm. left me with a 22-acre dairy goat farm in Oregon to run in the coldest winter we'd had in 40 years. He waltzed back in eventually, but uh, mm. wow. no, I, I, you know, after you have so much trauma, I think it's very difficult. to. Ha- and I was already, by the time I got out of high school, I was already a multi-rape survivor. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. So I had... Um, had a few difficult years there between the time I was 17 and the time I was, well, up until the time I was 22, I guess, 21, I got out of all of that, but I was still bouncing off walls, PTSDing everywhere. Of course. And yeah. not really, um, not, not, you know, how do you, how do you recognize what's healthy? That's you a, know, that's not yeah, that's a good point because it is that that cycle and um you know the cycle of domestic violence and you know unfortunately I've been exposed to it too and multiple yeah. women I know and it is hard to come out of that and and find a man because you tend to make the same mistakes without knowing and think oh this one's going to be good and for whatever because of your PTSD because of the traumas you know it's a really hard thing to navigate you know it takes a long yeah. time but you know at the end of the day sometimes you do find someone and i have thank god but 
you know, not a lot always. Of women yeah, stay scars are scars. That's yeah. So you know, with all that said, let's get into 2016. Um, always inspired by activism, you became the founding member of AirSol, which stands for End Rape Statute of Limitations, right. and um, the Justice. Uh, for Victims Act, effectively abolishing the um, SOL in California for rape and sexual assault. Uh, And you were instrumental in seeing Cosby prosecuted for his decades and decades of crimes against women. That's right. Well, um, the root of, of my activism and my coming out about being raped by Cosby was um, it culminated after, well, first of all, you know, after I left the Playboy Club and, you know, after the first six months and I did other things and acted in a lot of non-union films and union stuff and, and became a folk singer and was writing a lot of songs and picking a lot of guitar and doing hoot nannies, you know, open mic night kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I got a recording contract for Capitol Record with Capitol Records to do an album. And that was the end of 69. And um, my music attorney, who uh, was Frank Zappa's and the Cow Sills and Linda Ronstadt's music attorney, mm. and his brother was their personal manager, as he was mine. And uh, my little boy, who had just turned six, drowned in his swimming pool at the beginning of the party that he was giving to celebrate the successful negotiation of my recording contract. Mm. And uh, so I wound up living with Francesca for a period of time in Laurel Canyon because I was just incapable of functioning alone. And uh, she saved my life, you know. Mm. And um, so I was running out of my front money for the contract and I couldn't I I couldn't sing anymore. You know, it's like you see your child face down at the bottom of the deep end of a you, pool. And mm, it's a little scary. Yeah. bit of music and joy out of your life. Absolutely. So he uh, recommended that I go and audition for Bill Cosby because he had this television show. We thought he was doing I Spy. I have since found out that it was uh, the Cosby show. So um, oh. I guess that was the show after. And um, so I I went and he received me in his trailer, not an audition studio. And Franny had the good sense. She said, take that picture of Tony. That was my son. Mm -hmm. She said, tell him, tell him your story. Tell him what happened. And um, so I did. And he was absolutely mesmerized looking at this eight by 10 of my son, looking directly into the lens with his little sixties Afro. Right. He was a beautiful child. And, um, And he just sat there staring at the picture. And I just told him my story, and it got really uncomfortable. And finally, I realized, or I thought I was too much of a basket case to, for him to trust hiring as an actress, right? I didn't realize, of course, that, you know, he invited gals to his trailer so he could sexually assault them. But I finally, I just stood up, grabbed the picture and said, thank you. And walked out but then i i was with my roommate um because i moved my grandmother died three weeks after my son died so eventually i moved from france into her house in west hollywood um and um my roommate and i went to a, a restaurant the cafe figaro down on uh, melrose near doheny Um, I don't think it's there anymore. But anyway, I didn't know at the time that Cosby was a a part owner. Mm. And we're sitting at the table and he came to the table. Well, he already knew my story. Mm -hmm. So opening. And I was sitting crying into my onion soup because I was having a hell of a hell of a bad day. You know, I was just, you know, it hits you like a horse kicking you in the gut every once in a while. It just Mm -hmm. comes in. And this many years later, it's still course yeah i'm you know and um and he opened the conversation and put her in charge of me and suggested that she 
take me down to this finished steam bath on Santa Monica Boulevard and they'd get a massage and then he'd send his driver over to, our, to my grandma's house and pick us up and meet us on the strip and take us to dinner. And it would be good for Vicky, you know, Yeah, he's in such bad shape. So he, that's what he, he said. He, that's what Cosby said. It'd be good for Vicky. Yeah. Uh. Um, so, you know, that's basically what we did. And that was the night that he gave us pills to take because I was, uh, not being the cheerful, you know, mm -hmm. audience that mm -hmm. he apparently wanted. And he was, he was, um, you know, sparking off of her, you know, because she was actually the one he wanted. And, um, I was sort of the tag along, you know, the excuse for him being with her, I guess. And we both had boyfriends at the time, which was, you know, the silly thing. But anyway, so he uh, made it very clear that I was being a wet blanket and I should take this pill because it'll make, make us feel better. It'll make us all feel better. It'll make you feel better. And so, you know, he kind of guilted me into taking this pill. And I thought it was an upper because that's what everybody was taking in those days in the mm -hmm. nightclub. You know, all of the doctors and the managers, everybody would give you diet pills to keep your weight down so you could fit into the bunny costumes. Stay so up you late. <laughs> work more hours. Mm -hmm. Be careful the whole time your feet were killing you. You know, all of that. So, um, so I took the pill and she took the pill and he pretended to take a pill. Oh, and, my God. And then leaned over and put another pill in my mouth directly, and another pill directly in her mouth. And pretty soon our faces were almost in the plate. And I, I want to go home. And he said, oh, okay, sure. You know, so we staggered out of there. And uh, his chauffeur was not there at the parking lot. <laughs> and this was a, a steak restaurant right next to the Whiskey of Go-Go where we were. Um, a, another restaurant that's no longer there. But um, so I said, where did your where did your chauffeur go? And he said, oh, he had something else to do, but I'll drive you home. So uh, he drove us up to this place up in the hills that was like uh, he said his office and he wanted to show us his awards for I Spy and everything. And um, turned out it was basically his balling pad, you know, mm -hmm. with the you know awards and posters framed on the wall anyway um she was unconscious and i saved her from being raped by him while she was unconscious and i became lateral damage and then he walked out and left us there oh. and told a cab but we didn't know where we were and the, the phone we discovered was a prop oh my god whoa that's we, crazy. Yeah, so we we ran out uh, and staggered all the way down to the strip, uh, and managed to get home. And uh, it was, you know, it was it was a pretty horrific thing. So, you know, after I became very suicidal, and after a period of time, I wound up um, just walking away from everything. I just packed my my dog, my guitar case, and uh, whatever I could stuff in the car and and uh, hit the road. Moved out to Topanga Canyon for a year where I met my daughter's father. He was another singer, songwriter, guitar picker, son of a Louisiana congressman, Cajun congressman. And, um, and, I, and we just hit the road. And wound up in Louisiana for a few years on the bayou. Had my daughter, Mardi Gras night. It was a lot of fun. Everybody <laughs> else was having fun. I was in labor. You're in labor. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so tell us, because this is super important. Um, so, first, first of all, about the uh, Senator Connie Leva's bill, SB 813. Uh, well, I'm going, yeah. So, so after all those years, I finally broke my silence November 22nd of 2014 about right. my experience with Cosby. And I started speaking out in the media all the time, all the time. So 2016 came along. So the whole 2015, we were doing 
uh, CNN, Inside Edition, A&E, Dr. Phil, Don Lemon specials, NBC Dateline. It was, it was a whirlwind of media interviews. And so several of us sister survivors bonded and we became very close and we formed a sisterhood of because we were all, we all have the same common denominator. We all have the same rapist. And so comes 2016 and um, a friend of mine who used to be the director of women's issues in Sacramento um, let me know that there was this meeting being chaired by Ivy Bettini, who was one of the founders of the National Organization of Women. And she was like 89, blind, practically with a caregiver, but she had been watching um, Law and Order Special Victims Unit and was becoming so infuriated by the injustices sure. you know, uh, that were happening that she called a meeting. And I showed up Lily Bernard, who is the Afro-Cuban artist, who our sister survivor. She's one of the other women who the media called upon most frequently because um, we were a good match on the camera. We were both actresses. We were both educated, intelligent, articulate, and they knew they could get a reliable interview with us. So, um, and we look good together, you know, the young vibrant african-american uh, afro-cuban artist and the old blonde you know so um so we did a lot of interviewing together and we were founding members of that with carolyn heldman who's a phd political science professor at occidental and uh, was a talking head on uh, fox and um, she became the co-chair and strategized our whole um lobbying, testifying, uh, rallying on the state capitol steps. And we had tried to go to um, our vice president uh, to write the bill. First, we'd gone to Connie Leva, and she's a senator from San Bernardino County, and she wasn't interested until we went uh, to our now amazing uh vice president. And as soon as we started to go to her, Connie said, oh, I'll do it. And so she wrote our bill, SB 813. And a bunch of us, we carpooled up to Sacramento. Carolyn got sweets for us. And we were out there. We had our t-shirts with, you know, our um, aerosol logo on them. And we testified in front of the Senate committee for public safety. Uh, we rallied on the state, state Capitol steps. We walked everywhere with Co Gloria Allred, um, I, who I'm proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with mm -hmm. throughout this process. She's an amazing woman, no mm -hmm. matter what anybody mm -hmm. says about her. She's a, a rock star, in my opinion. And, um, and actually, a, a little soundbite of my uh, testifying in front of the uh, Senate committee is in her documentary called Seeing All Red, mm -hmm. which is fabulous. You've got to see it. It's on Netflix. And um, and so we we just did it. You know, we testified everywhere. Anybody would listen. And uh, finally, and Governor Brown wasn't interested in signing it. He had some issues about that. Um, and, you know, everybody put pressure. I wrote him a letter um, the morning, early the morning, um, an email, um, and, and just happened to mention that uh, the night before my son died, I had had dinner with Linda Ronstadt, who i uh, as you know, used to be his girlfriend. And I kind of indicated in my letter that he needed to stop riding fences. Mm. And later that day, he did sign the bill. And uh, so it became effective January 1st, 2017. It was not retroactive, only from that point forward. Now, this past year, well, past couple of years, there was a window of opportunity for um, women who had been minors when they were raped. Okay, so there's an exception to the rule. Well, not at that time. This mm. was an another bill, and I can't remember the name of the bill. 
And so some of the sisters who were raped by various people uh, when they were minors were able to file. But it still didn't help adult survivors who, whose statute of limitations had long expired. Now, as of, I think it was September, possibly a new bill has been written, and Governor Newsom signed it, allowing um, those whose statute of limitations um, had expired by 2017, um, but were raped after 2009, could also file. There is also an exception, a one-year window of uh, opportunity for those of us to file who go way back. Okay. But only one year. So I can't really discuss anything more about that in, in my sure. case. You know, at the end of the day, how many women um, came forward as Cosby victims? Uh, there were 62 of us public, and each of us knew probably one or two more. Wow. Who were afraid to to go public. Yeah. Ugh. He is probably the most prolific serial rapist of the 20th century. Sure. And he's already free. Now, Harvey Weinstein got another 16 years tagged on to his existing 35. Right. I saw that, yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be a life sentence, pretty sure. Well, yeah, yeah. sure. He's yeah. going to die. Either way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the name of the four-part series on Showtime uh, that they did? I, I watched it, and it was amazing, but for our listeners. Um, ah, we need to talk about Cosby. We need to talk about Cosby. That's right. Yeah. Great series. Yeah, w. Bell. yeah I, I encourage um, our listeners to um, to find that on Showtime. It's a four-part series, and it's, it's, uh, it's impressive. And seeing red. Yeah. Seeing all, all red. Seeing all, all red. Great, great, great. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. Victoria um, has written her memoir, My Dirty Diamonds, The Repurposed Life of a Playboy Icon and Cosby Survivor. Um, is it available right now for people to purchase? Where can they I, find it? Or, or it's still in the works? Well, it was published uh, the end of September. Um, and it was a bestseller before 9.45 that morning for two months. And then there was a little bit of a glitch with the publisher. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it is now uh, unpublished. I am uh, working on going through it with another proofreader because there were a lot of errors and typos and, you know, things that were not uh, properly done. Well, yeah, it, yeah, it needs to be on point because this is an important um, story. It's your it's your book. It's your life. So it needs to be done just right as you and I had discussed. So with that yeah. said, it will be available. Um, and when it is, we'll go ahead and make an announcement on the show and let people know. But it is ca called My Dirty Diamonds, The Repurposed yeah, Life. Yeah, Dirty, 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 Dirty Diamonds. Dirty Diamonds, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And, and Dirty Diamonds is really kind of a metaphor um, it, it came from an actual anecdote back when I was working at the club and anyone who reads the book can read that story. So I won't take up the time telling that story, but the metaphor for life really, because we're all given these beautiful, brilliant gifts in life. And if we don't take care of them, they get dirty, mm, I you know, love that. Yeah. But we're wearing them all the time and we don't notice to us, they still look fine. Mm -hmm. You know, but they get dulled and they get, they lose their sparkle, they lose their shine, they lose their luminosity because mm -hmm. we haven't valued them enough to take care of them properly. And I think that speaks to, you know, the gifts of the soul, the gifts that we were given at birth, you know, the gift of life, the gift of beauty, the gift of intelligence, the gift of spirituality, all of those things, and the gift of love and unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned from my youngest daughter who said, Mama, healthy boundaries, healthy boundaries. Mm, yeah. And, I, you know, you're right, mm -hmm. healthy boundaries. And we have to, um, we have to feel entitled to, establish healthy boundaries absolutely. for ourselves absolutely and, for and additionally um 
not only healthy boundaries, but we have to stop just teaching women how to protect themselves. We have to teach little boys right from the very beginning. We have to re-educate the men in our lives and in the world to respect and honor women. Absolutely. And then we have to teach the women to feel, to demand it, Mm -hmm. you know, to be, to feel entitled Mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of us don't feel entitled to respect and honor, and that's something that needs to change. I wholeheartedly agree with that. That's a really, really good uh, statement and one that we should all live by. Absolutely. Well, on behalf of all women, we're just so glad that you went after this Mm. bill and changed things for survivors because, I mean, it needed to be done. And Mm -hmm. I just... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Well, you're welcome. There are two other bills that we have to work on having codified, aside from abolishing the statute of limitations on a federal level. There are many of my sister survivors who are now codifying uh, the statute. They expanded the statute in Nevada, uh, Lisa Lotta Lublin in Nevada, and uh, Heidi Thomas and Beth Ferrier Tillo. All of us Cosby survivors, they expanded the statute of limitations from, I think, four years to 20 years. Good. But Good. now they're trying to abolish it completely. And so they're working there. Good. Also, they're trying to uh, codify the legal definition of consent. During the Cosby trials, we discovered that there is no legal definition of consent. Mm. I had no idea. Wow. I have no yeah. idea. Is there and anything that we could do? Are there a list of people we can write letters to? What could we do to help? Well, absolutely. You must write your representative, write your congressman, write your, your senators, absolutely write okay. and, and rally and have meetings and find people who know how to write bills okay. and get out there and 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 speak about it at every opportunity. Absolutely. And the other thing let me mention, I don't know how we are on time, but um, that I think is very important. You know, the Equal Rights Amendment that was uh, ratified in uh, 1964 is not ratified in every state. It's state by state. So here in uh, California, I am equal to a man under the Equal Rights Amendment. You in Texas are not. Mm -hmm. I don't think I realized (laughs) Texas. And <laughs> nor, breed nor, of a state, as we know. <laughs> wow. Nor in Alabama, nor in Louisiana, nor in Mississippi, nor in Georgia. Okay. Most yeah. of the southern states are the ones where women are not equal under the law, under the Constitution to men. So, as an example, I'm equal here in California, but if I come to, say, Mississippi for any reason, and to visit, say, my nephew who might live in Mississippi, a nephew, a younger nephew whose diapers I changed, perhaps, right. who has right. the same ancestral roots as I have, he will be equal under the Constitution to other men, but I, I'm not. the old no. auntie who changed his diapers, whose ancestors also fought in the Revolutionary War, will not be equal and will not have the same rights under the constitution as he does. Okay. So you think about that seriously. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Th- thank you for sharing that with us. And it's, you know, uh, um, uh, it's important to know voices and, yeah. and, and collective, the more and more and the more we show up and write our representatives and whatnot. Yeah. It's, it's important. Okay. So we do need to wrap up. We have a guest waiting. Um, but at the end of each show, I want, uh, we ask two questions and we want to ask you. Okay. Okay. Do you remember what they were? Okay. <laughs> well, you'll get it. My, my okay. mind is so, really, and I'm so, writing letters in my mind okay, already. So, <laughs> so three words to you that define Hugh Hefner. Old school romantic. Oh, I love that you said that. That's brilliant. That's so true. <laughs> um, gosh, what else? A little, a little delusional about women at this at <laughs> The end of his life. The end of his life. I think we are in agreement agreement on that. that, It it kind of seemed to go downhill towards the end, for sure. Yeah. Um, 
he was also very patriarchal. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. many of the things that we are rebelling against right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I think that he blew the lid off of, um, well, he, he, he kicked the sexual revolution into high gear. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. He's very you know, responsible and, for that. And, uh, in the beginning, made it possible for women to own their own sexuality. Exactly. Okay. And not be ashamed. Right. And not be ashamed. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Second question. Had you had the opportunity to speak to Hef before he passed or in memoriam, what would you say? I would say thank you for giving me a platform. Yay. I love that. That's wonderful. That's good. I'm the oldest woman who's ever posed for Playboy, by the way, since Jane Seymour. Right. posed... When you came back for the equality issue. Yeah, you were one of the, yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. We'll we'll, we'll throw those pictures up actually um, during editing so um, our audience will be able to see the scope of what you've done. So thank you so much, Victoria. This has been lovely. I appreciate you. I love you. So much respect. It was so nice to meet you. Yeah. Well, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Proud to have you as a Playboy centerfold sister. Yeah. Absolutely. Sisters forever. Forever. To our audience, don't forget to follow us, like us, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's The Bunny Chronicles. Uh, Follow us on Instagram at TBC Vodcast, as in The Bunny Chronicles Vodcast. And that's a wrap. I'm Echo. I'm Carrie. And this is The The Bunny Bunny Chronicles. Chronicles. See you next week. (laughs) 